This is the Worldly Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Holly. And I'm Luke. Through the conversations on this podcast, we're seeking to connect with what worldly wellbeing means. And by listening today, you are part of that conversation too. Today, we're joined by the fabulous Alice Taylor for what will be an absolutely riveting conversation around journalism and media consumption. I'm excited to see how the conversation goes. So let's get stuck in. Good morning. Good morning, Alice. Good morning. Lovely to have you here with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Can you tell us, Alice, where you are based right now? Where are you coming live right. from? So I live in Albania, um, of all places. I've lived here for three and a half years by way of Malta and Cyprus. Um, see, I came from the UK originally. Um, in case you couldn't tell from the accent. Um, (laughs) And I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist for seven, nearly eight years now. Wonderful. And you have um, an online blog and uh, you are a journalist and write for a number of publications. Did you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah. So um, I've been, I started my journalistic career in Malta. I was inspired by Daphne Caruana Galizia, who was later assassinated. But um, I started, I sort of idolised her and decided I wanted to become a journalist. There I worked for the the national media, uh, sort of the main national paper, and I worked for an independent investigative platform called The Shift News. And then I ended up in Albania on holiday for three days, and that was three and a half years ago, and I'm still here. Now, when I came to Albania, I said, I'm not going to write about politics at all, definitely not. Uh, But that went out the window after about six months. And I'm writing for Exit.al, the English edition, which is the main, uh, one of the few English uh, media, independent media in the country. Um, I also, when I came to Albania and decided I was going to live here, my mum, my friends were like, really? Is it safe? What's it like? You know, no one knew anything about it apart from what they'd maybe seen in the news. And I thought, huh, well, I'm a writer. And this country's awesome. So maybe I should set up a blog. So I did. Never, I've never blogged before. This blog, The Balkanista, went viral. It's um, still very popular, even though I don't have so much time for it. Um, and that's it, really. Brilliant. And I think the, the Balkanista blog is definitely kind of um, kind of a touchstone for me as well. Like, you know, I, I've lived and work in Albania, but I really love going back to it to kind of mm-hmm. hear your views and also get yeah. those kind of insider tips from someone who's still living there. Um, And in previous episodes of the Wildly Wellbeing podcast, we've spoken to Annie from Tech Ura, uh, Mm -hmm. working uh, uh, with marginalized people, particularly in the Café Aremis region, and also my experiences of living um, in Albania. Mm -hmm. So those of you who haven't listened to those episodes yet, go back and listen to them and also check out Alice's blog, The Balkanista. So thinking specifically, perhaps what your work writing uh, for an English publication Mm -hmm. in Tirana, uh, in Albania, what's that like? Yeah. You know, as a as a journal as a kind of a British journalist yeah. by way of Malta and Cyprus, uh, <laughs> what's it like to to report in Tirana? Well, when I first came to Albania, it was three and a half years ago, not that long ago, there was very little in English um, available, very little information available. So this applies to both my blog, which is a positive sort of you know the reasons why I love the country, and Exit, uh, which is the realistic sort of political situation. We touch crime and corruption, human rights issues, sort of all the nitty gritty subjects, you know. Um, Now, yes, so at this time, there wasn't much content in English available. Um, And then I came along, not really feeling intimidated by anyone or anything, not afraid to touch any story, and publishing my opinion and facts in English, ergo available to the entire world. Um, Now, this happened at the same time, around the same time that Albania was sort of progressing in its EU candidate status. Um, The accession, like formalities were pinpointed to open. And this meant that there was a renewed, like a growing international interest in Albania. So people were curious what was going on. Political matters became much more relevant to those living in Europe. So... This was great for me and for Exit in terms of the popularity of the site, but it also brought with it a lot of challenges and unwanted attention. So the government and those I have criticised or published scandals or even just reported on, you know, like I reported on government protests, etc., anti-government protests, they were not so happy that I was reporting in English um, and that these reports were being picked up internationally. So 
I've had a fair share of issues with the government, but instead of uh, sort of succumbing to it or being silenced, I decided to write more and take them to court, which I did. And I won. So there's Yay. that, which is great. Um, I love how casually you said all of yeah. that as well. <laughs> yeah. So I took them to court. And then I wrote about it. Um, no, I felt that, I mean, at the time that this happened, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail because I've talked about it before recently and it's quite a emotional subject, but I felt that these pressures that were being put on me as a foreigner in Albania, if I succumbed to it, if I stopped writing, if I accepted it, if I sort of stopped being a journalist or whatever, I felt I would be setting a very bad example for others in the country, for young journalists who want to follow this sort of investigative path. Um, Because in Albania, there's this this sort of uh, pledge that you must treat foreigners, guests with the utmost respect. So the fact that I was attacked in this way was really quite shocking sort of in, in Albanian society. And I thought, if I take this lying down, I'm setting a precedent for potentially for the future. So I have to fight it to show that you can win against them and that you don't have to be scared. It sounds like for a journalist, your voice is, I guess, really everything and mm-hmm. your, your kind of tool. And that what you've just experienced, what you experienced in Albania was really trying to silence your voice. Mm-hmm. Is that indicative of journalism or being a female journalist in general? Or is um, that too broad a question? <laughs> no, no, not at all. In fact, journalism, if you look at the statistics in terms of imprisoned journalists, attacked journalists, murdered journalists... It's one of the most dangerous professions globally. Um, it's And it's getting worse as well. If you look at recent reports over the last few years from like Reporters Without Borders, the Council of Europe, even the EU, um, and there's a number of online monitoring sites that sort of record threats against journalists and attacks, it's getting worse. Um, so it is a dangerous, it is a dangerous profession. I think the facts of the internet, social media, independent platforms, podcasts. This has given journalists many more avenues to independently report on corruption and crime, which is a threat to those very entities. So people want to silence them even, silence us even more. But female journalists as well um, are more likely to be harassed, um, to be threatened with sexual violence or actual violence. Uh, We're more likely to be attacked in public as well. There was two murders recently in Europe of journalists. There was Victoria, I can't remember her surname, or I'm sorry, in Bulgaria, and Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta, who was assassinated with a car bomb in 2017. Um, but I, I read a recent report about um, threats and harassment against female journalists, and it had increased from December 2020 to February of this year, there was an increase in reports by around 61%. Wow. I mean, this is, as a woman on the internet, you are more likely to receive unsolicited photos, harassment, name calling, trolling, etc. But then when you add journalism into the mix as well, you're more likely to be targeted. You're also more likely to be not believed than a male counterpart. That's so and- frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's terrifying. And particularly we're coming from a context at the moment in the UK where violence against women is mm-hmm. has been highlighted again recently. Um and it, it it's uh you know uh, an alarming and terrifying mm-hmm. prospect that a country like the UK in 2021 misogyny and violence against women is still really prevalent. Yeah. Um, and it's actually kind of insidiously part of our culture. Yes. Um, and I wonder for you as a as a woman in Albania, in, in Eastern Europe, uh, in a profession like journalism that you've already suggested is, is dangerous regardless of, of mm-hmm. gender, but perhaps even more so for women, how does that make you feel? I've been asked this before and... I guess I should be worried. I think when your colleague, I don't know, I don't know if this, like Daphne, who was the reason why I started, started who uh, the reason I quit my job to become a journalist and then she was murdered. Okay, it made me a bit scared at the time and I considered quitting, but I think when you become a journalist, you know what, or you should have an idea of what to expect. I'm not excusing what happens, like the attacks and, you know, harassment. But 
you know it comes with risks unless you're like a gardening journalist or a food journalist <laughs> you know if you're going to tackle difficult subjects you have to know that there are risks with it and I think whether you accept that or not is based on your personality like I have a family and I do worry sometimes but this is who I am I can't step away from it I wanted to touch on something you said about the UK and Mm. internalized misogyny and this you know we don't expect it do you know what I I had always thought Albania is so struggles so much with women's equality and I was having a discussion the other day with my friend about at what age a woman first experiences sexual assault or sexual harassment and I was telling her that I remember in school having my skirt lifted up in the playground by boys like it was something that happened it was something yes. that happened. Did it happen to you? Yes, it was like a thing. Every lunchtime, like we used to wear shorts under our skirts because it was so bad. Having your bra strap pinged in class, mm. having it unfastened. They used to target one of the girls in my class who had big, um, rather large. Anyway, they big <laughs> boobies. <laughs> She's the kind of girl I was jealous of at school. Yeah, but they used to sneak up behind her and some guy who'd obviously, I mean, I don't know, can I say this? I don't, I know adult men who struggle, but he would sort of <laughs> do it with one hand, unclasp it with one hand. And I shouldn't be laughing because this is sexual assault. This is harass- sexual harassment. You know, my friend in Albania was completely shocked by this. She said, boys and girls in Albania, you couldn't even, you wouldn't even play together, let alone do this sort of thing. But it was only at that moment that I realised that all those things that happened, that I considered just a normal part of being a kid in the UK, up till that moment, was actually really wrong. And it's kind of interesting, because it's only now that we say these things out loud. And I guess that's what journalism is about is saying mm-hmm. things out loud for others to hear or highlighting them and when we say them out loud we realize hang on like I guarantee most women I know in the UK have had their skirt lifted up when they were at school it was just what happened but can you imagine what would happen if you went up to a grown woman on the street and lift her skirt up <laughs> you'd be arrested I would hope yeah. but you know it's it really shocked me this was a conversation I had yesterday and I was like my gosh you know this is something that happens to all of us that none of us have realized is bad until we say it out loud. Like you realized it just now. <laughs> you yeah. went, oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's humbling for me as a, as a man in this conversation and who a guy who has predominantly female friends, my, my, my yeah. close circle of friends are women, um, to kind of hear those experiences mm-hmm. and to acknowledge their, you know, the times in which, either I've been silent and not challenged and and not been part of the solution because I was blind to the kind of uh, insidious nature of it. Like at Mm -hmm. school, if someone was skirted or whatever, then, you know, as you said, Alice, it was kind of treated as part of the the culture. Mm -hmm. Um, So the times that I've been silent accidentally, but also silent where I've just not wanted to make a fuss. Yes. But also the times in which I've seen women... And this, again, because I, I, I work and, and socialise with a lot of women, the times in which I've seen women go above and beyond to to achieve and to, to kind of deliver what they want to do and do so excellently mm-hmm. with everything that is thrown at them mm-hmm. by society, by various cultures. Um, yeah. And it's something that, you know, as a man where I walk into a room, no one questions my right to be there. You know, yes. there are other prejudices that are levied against me, but it's not based on on my sexual gender identity. Mm-hmm. But that f- acknowledging that my my female counterparts uh, walking into a room often I- immediately there's kind of one mark against them. Yes, yeah, yeah. But you know what? In the context of journalism, I wrote an article recently um, for International Women's Day, and I reeled off a list. Well, I was thinking to myself about all the journalists I admire in Albania. And that I think are on the right path. They're doing things well. I I think they're astonishingly brave, whatever. And 90% of them were female. Like, they're, it was really, really good to, like, I hadn't even realized, you know? And then when I sort of looked at my list, I was like, huh, great, you know? So there is a generation of very, very strong, young and older Albanian women who are 
smashing the patriarchy, so to speak, and are, and are tackling really tough stories. You know, not just writing about, oh, so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that. You know, they're tackling organized crime, corruption at very high levels. They're doing sort of fact-checking and myth-busting articles and stuff like that. And it was really encouraging for me to see that. And I was very happy about that as well. So even in this really patriarchal industry, in a very patriarchal sort of gender role-based society, these girls are, are taking the lead. That's really inspiring. So I guess a lot of the topics that journalists cover, maybe sadly, a lot of things in terms of themes have not changed. Um, But what have you noticed has really changed in the world of journalism in the last few years? Well, so there's there's two things, um, one which we've already touched on, which is the threats that people face. So I've noticed just in the years that I've been working, I'm reporting on threats against media freedom more often which is sad but this is the this is the case um and then there's uh, you know in this age we really have to um counter disinformation mm-hmm. and fake news but there's a big obstacle there i'm i'm talking like in the maltese context where i worked for several years and in albania as well there's a lack of media literacy in the general population it's compounded when in a country like malta or especially Albania, where there are less English speakers, it's very difficult for people to fact check what they're being presented with in their own language. They can't just go on to the CDC website or um, who, like the World Health Organization, I'm talking about COVID here. So it's difficult for them to fact check and they just accept what they're reading. You know, you could be the most ethical journalist in the world. You could have spent, like I've done, I've spent a week writing an article because I'm making sure everything is exactly correct in it. I could present that next to a claim that the COVID vaccine will make you grow a tail and give you superpowers. And if if you don't know how to fact check, how to evaluate sources, how to be sure that what you're reading is not disinformation, those articles are equal to you. You know, if you think, oh, well, it's on a news site, so it must be true. And that's where your sort of evaluation ends. Um, That's an issue. Now, I don't want it to sound like I'm saying people are stupid because I'm not. I'm saying that in lots of countries, even in Europe, there is not enough attention in the education system. There is not, not enough focus on teaching media literacy and how to counter disinformation that you might find on social media like Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, etc. And I think considering the way we're consuming media now, um, this really needs to be included. We need to teach kids how to understand what they're reading and how to evaluate it because fake news disinformation is one of the most dangerous things, one of the most dangerous threats to our existence. Yeah. And I say that seriously. Yeah, that that critical thinking piece, I think, is is really important. I consider myself really fortunate that I did, my my degrees are required a certain level of critical thinking. They weren't related to media at all, um, but they required that kind of certain. Here's a text, pull it apart, rip it to pieces, yeah. find other texts that disagree with it, and and kind of kind of compare. And I guess Holly, your kind of art experience is very similar to that. Mm-hmm. The kind of the critiquing and and not taking everything at face value. Um, whereas I, I think you're right, Alice, not not everyone has access to that level of no. training in terms of critical skill sets. Um, and I'm wondering then, what is the role of a, of a journalist or journalist more broadly in challenging both that you were talking about fake news and, and disinformation? Um, so challenging those areas, but also encouraging people to think critically. Well, it's difficult because I'm a journalist. I'm not a lecturer of journalism you know I'm not a I'm not a professional in that respect but like what I've tried to do recently so with Exit where I work um we were approached by Reporters Without Borders, UNESCO and the Ethical Journalism Network as a group and they asked us if we wanted to be part of a pilot uh, ethical audit now this required us bringing all of our internal policies up to international best standards publishing it all as well, declaring everything from our ownership structure to financing. Anyway, we did all that. But part of this process was laying down really firm editorial standards. So 
the process of how an article is fact-checked, how, you know, the, the quality of the sources we use, what's acceptable, what's not, how it's, you know, edited by two or three different people and how the reader can hold us accountable if we've made a mistake. And we published this in both languages on our website. And I think more media should do this because it not only, like, as I was going through the process, I was then able to train our staff um, on this to make sure they were all up to scratch. By putting it on your website in the native language, you can give an opportunity to people to understand the process of how you're creating an article. And if they find something that's not okay, we have a button on our website that you can click and file a complaint directly with an external ombudsman who we have pledged to be bound by their decision. Now, this method of self-regulation is something that I think should be adopted by more media. This sort of transparency, this is one way that you can sort of chip away at the issue of educating people or getting them to think more critically. But other than that, I mean, this, other than the standard that we can set as journalists, it has to come from schools with the next generation. Mm -hmm. It has to, like, some people in my mum's generation, you could tell them the sky is blue, but if a website has said it's pink, they're not going to believe you. You know, this is something that would change sort of generationally. As a journalist, our responsibility is to do our best to maintain ethical standards at all times um, and to be consistent with that and to admit and be transparent if we've made a mistake. So we made a mistake in an article the other day. Um, we translated it and there was a misquote and we uh, changed it. We, we put at the top of the article, the previous version of this article had made a mistake. This is the correction. And we then republished it across all social media platforms. So this is what people need to do. If you've made a mistake, if you've slipped up, you have to own it, accept it, and then people can see you know, and maybe they will have a bit more trust. But otherwise, it's got to be education with the younger generation. It's it just reminded me a few weeks ago, I read an article. I just had a quick Google to see if I could find it again. And in Finland, they are fighting fake news in the classroom. Yep. So they've set up classes um, mm -hmm. to kind of educate students, I guess, yeah, yeah. about critical thinking. And I believe there's a few other, oh, yeah, so some others. Northern European countries like Denmark, yeah. the Netherlands, Sweden, yeah. which is really great. great. Yeah. It's exactly no. what we need. Like you're saying, starting from a young age, mm -hmm. having an awareness um, and getting those skills to analyse yeah. and look deeper. Like I did um, at my school, we did we had a mandatory critical thinking class, um, I think in year 11, uh, like once a week. But obviously when I went to school, um, when I think we went to school, mm. the, the the situation is not as it is now. You know, internet took half an hour to get online. If your mum wanted to call her mate, you had to come offline and log out of MSN. You know, it's completely different. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mum, I just need to finish talking to the boy I like. You know? yeah. um, but it was good you had to come offline because then when you signed into MSN again, maybe he'd notice you and start talking to you. Anyway, so it's completely <laughs> changed. Like how my daughter is going to consume news and even with her education, like she's pretty screen free at the moment, but when she goes to school, they're going to be using computers, screens, et cetera. So the critical thinking I learned in school is worlds away from what she will need to deal with social media, to deal with um, like messaging platforms and to deal with billions of different websites that are on the internet. But yeah, it has to start. It's it's so important. And I don't think any focus, enough focus has been given to this. Finland are fantastic for everything. So yeah. we should be following them or just move to Finland. Go Finland. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In my mind, I'm seeing like a, a pincer movement then of of two pieces where you've got the accountability level of, of journalists and, and news outlets and, and media publications, you know, being willing to be held accountable and also the public holding them to account mm -hmm. and that, that level of accountability I think is so important across all areas of society whether it's government I work for charities accountability in charities is essential um, and we've seen real problems where charities or faith groups have not been yeah. account held accountable and mm -hmm. what happens then so you've got that level the essentiality of accountability but also then the necessity of critical thinking and the education of critical thinking. And, and perhaps then with this, that kind of pincer movement, that double whammy, we might actually 
get somewhere and yeah. see some progress. Because um, you you can't rely on people like Facebook and Twitter. I mean, Twitter's made an effort, but um, you can't rely on these people to moderate their content. You need to give empower people mm. to know what they're consuming. Talk to us about Facebook then mm-hmm. and what's been happening with mm-hmm. Facebook. So Reporters Without Borders earlier this week have filed a lawsuit in France um, against Facebook. Now, they filed in France because France has pretty favourable consumer laws. What they've um, sued them for is commercial deception. So they are arguing that Facebook's terms of services state pretty clearly in several points that Facebook will... um, tackle disinformation and fake news on the platform, provide a safe space for people, tackle hate speech, yada, yada, yada. They've even run advertising campaigns sort of reinforcing this in media around the world. And Reporters Without Borders are saying this is not true. You are deceiving people because you are not tackling disinformation. I think it was in just one month I read it was like 2.1 billion clicks on disinformation on Facebook. And yes, okay, sometimes they flag things, but they don't always. Um, So they either need to step up their game or stop claiming that they're doing this when they're clearly not. Uh, Also, there are, I mean, I've had issues with them as well, where I've received death threats on Facebook and I've reported it to Facebook. And Facebook has said, this does not violate our community standards. But then when I've called someone a Muppet, I found myself banned for 24 hours. Not that I do that very often, but, you know, my patience is only so long. (laughs) Sometimes people are Muppets. Exactly. And they probably need to be told that. And they deserve it. And, you know, you're lucky I called you a Muppet because what I was thinking was a lot worse than that. But this is, it's this weird double standards. I don't know if it's algorithm based or they're just incompetent or they don't want to. But they either need to step it up or stop claiming that they're creating this so-called safe space because they're not. And this is what Reporters Without Borders is saying, that they're deceiving the public. And they've provided lots of legal reports um, to do with attacks and threats, harassment, doxing on women and female journalists and journalists and sort of in the broader context of fake news and disinformation as well. Now, this is a very important lawsuit because although it's in France, Facebook's terms of service are the same internationally. So a ruling against Facebook here could have big implications for them globally and it would pave way for similar lawsuits in every other jurisdiction where they are in the world. For me, there's... I personally would, I I don't view Facebook as a kind of a safe platform to receive Mm. my information of the world. And I think there is a divide in in kind of societies where some people do access their news that way and do access their kind of um, understanding of the world that way and those that don't. And I think then what we get is a polarizing situation where you've got people who are polarized at either end, usually, um, and, and the truth is nowhere to be found yeah. amongst any of it because, um, you, because it's become so polarized. You end up creating this bubble, an algorithmic bubble around yourself of like-minded people, like-minded content, and hate speech flourishes in those mm. in those areas. I, uh, One of the newspapers I work for in Malta, we found a network of Facebook groups that had been set up um, specifically in Malta to coordinate harassment and doxing against female journalists. Yeah, like specifically for, and they were, and activists as well, and they were posting like ID card details of people. Um, And Facebook does nothing, but you can't call someone a Muppet. That's just shocking. Mm -hmm. I feel like we live in a world where entertainment and information are so the borders are so merged Mm -hmm. that it's very easy to confuse the two or to mix them. There was a part of that that kind of began with the inception of reality TV Mm -hmm. uh, and scripted reality TV in that you kind of were watching something that deep down inside you probably knew wasn't real or at least wasn't fully real but you wanted to believe that it was um, and you were willing to kind of ignore the kind of glaring the obvious moments where it was scripted because it provided entertainment Mm -hmm. and now I feel like we've evolved from that to not even really cocking where we're being fed stuff that is purely just to 
gain likes or to to feed entertainment. Um, and we've kind of shifted into this bizarre alter ego world state where we're kind of, you know, what is news and what is entertainment? What are we being fed just to get likes and to make us laugh or to get us angry? And what are we actually being fed to be educated? If we go back to like the early 2000s, um, which I know we all remember. Um, <laughs> Sadly, yes. <laughs> You know how old I feel when I see I speak to someone who's an adult who was born in like 2003. Um, I refuse to believe that. No, (laughs) No, I'm like, this is this is not true. This is. Yeah. So if we go back to sort of that period where the Internet was quite widely used, but to upload something to YouTube, to create a website was not something that your average person could do. It was quite expensive. You needed a professional. People didn't, you couldn't just create your own website. There weren't these blogging sites. People had an element of trust in what was on the internet because it was something that not everybody could create. So it's obviously come from a source with money, with authority, whatever. But now we're in a situation where literally anyone with a smartphone can create anything they want, a news website, a blog site, a podcast, a social media channel. They can set up their own TV channel if they want or radio online. So there's no sort of barrier in the way of who's putting content out there. But still, many people maybe still have this mindset of if it's on the Internet, if it's on a podcast, if it's on YouTube, it must be true or it must be reliable information. That's what I think. Maybe there's still some of this there and that's being exploited. Hmm. I mean, yeah, I am absolutely. grateful that it did mean that Luke and I could <laughs> make a website and a podcast and not have to yeah. do hours of training in advance. <laughs> yeah, me too. You know, I set up a podcast. I didn't have a cl- absolute clue what I was doing. And I mean, you can tell when you listen to the first episode. But that, I mean, it's it's great because we are not peddling fake news or, yeah. you know, any, trying to down a government or, well, maybe but um we're not doing it <laughs> not, yes. not i'm not disclaimer um we're not doing it with nefarious intentions but the truth is absolutely anyone on the planet who has any um sort of underhand intentions can set up a platform that can influence people mm. yeah and i think that's where it comes back to our you know i'm i'm, I'm imagining our pincer movement again of the accountability and critical thinking piece again yeah the, the literal pincers i like, wish we had you know, visual how, how, for this because yeah. so like, like crabs yeah. <laughs> arms Snappy. moving in on the screen um but that 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 the necessity for accountability mm-hmm. and critical thinking particularly in in media consumption is so important mm-hmm. alice thank you so much for your <laughs> time you. today it's been absolutely wonderful to have such a rich and diverse conversation with you um so thank you for being part of the world you are being podcast thank you so much it was it was great and um i hope to see you in albania soon where we can continue our discussion yes that I mean, as great. soon as it's not illegal for me to get on a plane <laughs> <laughs> i will do it luke is going to awesome. be running to that airport he won't even yeah. bother with a taxi he's gonna be like i'm there Crying. <laughs> We're really grateful to Alice for joining us today on the Wildly Wellbeing podcast. And we're really looking forward to seeing her work continue to evolve, particularly in this vital area of journalistic integrity. Yeah. And do check out in the show notes where we will link to um, Alice's work so you can check out her blog there and all of the other great work that she's doing at the moment. In the meantime, we are beavering away in the background, preparing many other wonderful episodes of the World of Wellbeing podcast. So we're looking forward to you joining us again for those conversations in the future. Don't forget yeah. to subscribe and rate us on any of the wonderful platforms that you choose to engage with our podcast on. And you can find us on Instagram and on our website, which we'll put in the show notes as well. Yeah, I mean, check out the show notes because that is where all the useful stuff is. We've started using the phrase show notes, which I think makes us feel really professional. Are they even show notes? I've heard other people refer to the show notes, so I'm going to keep using that phrase because it makes me sound like I know what I'm doing. Yeah, I mean, dear listeners, please consult our show notes. Go forth and consult. (laughs) And we really look forward to having you back with us next week with another guest who we will not reveal their identity just yet. Keep you in suspense. Ciao for now. Ta-ra for now. Ta-ra for now.